<laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Larry Lederman. I'm the chair of the Ambassador Speaker Series at Carleton University. First, I would like to recognize some of our guests, the Ambassador of Moldova, Her Excellency Alla Belesha, um, the Ambassador of Croatia, Her Excellency Marice Matkovic, the Ambassador d'Algerie, Son Excellence, Hossein Megar, uh, the Ambassador of Serbia, His Excellency Mihailo Papazoglu, and uh, the Charge d'Affaires of uh, Poland, Lukasz Feremiuk, have I forgotten any ambassadors? And Bosnia, and Bosnia and Herzegovina, the ambassador of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Thank you. <laughs> and um, I would also like to welcome members of the embassies of uh, Mexico, Germany, Indonesia, Russia, Belgium, and Latvia, Costa Rica, and the mission of the EU. And former Canadian ambassadors, Larry Dickinson members of the Department of Global Affairs and others from the Canadian government and students and faculty from Carleton University, and our co-host, the Associate Vice President of Research and International, Pauline Rankin, over there. Now it is my great pleasure to ask the Director of the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs, Dane Rollins, to introduce our guest speaker. Thank you, Larry. Uh, that, uh Nice welcome to everybody here. So uh, again, uh, welcome to the MPD at Carleton University. Uh, it's a great privilege for us at the university to host these events that Larry kindly organizes on our behalf. And at the beginning of every year, we get to go through the list of many countries to figure out, okay, who are we going to bring in this time? And we always want to change it up a little bit and have a different bit of regional representation. And this year, uh, for this particular event, we were very happy to bring back uh, uh, the an ambassador from Eastern Europe, uh, but more importantly, an ambassador who is representing a country uh, recently heavily involved in all of the very interesting events in Europe uh, in, in, with the presidency of the, of the European Council. So uh, that was one of the big justifications, but of course, Europe is inevitably uh, on our uh, radar screen of places of interest, so we're very interested to hear what you will have to say. So we're very pleased to have with us the Ambassador of the Slovak Republic, His Excellency Andrei Droba. Uh, Ambassador Droba graduated with a master's degree uh, in trade and marketing from the University of Bratislava. Uh, he joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister in 1998. And since then, he has been working mostly in the Foreign Ministry. He was Deputy Director of the Office of the Minister, assigned to the permanent mission in the United Nations uh, for, its, for the Slovak Republic. Uh, returned to the Ministry of, of Foreign Affairs as Director of the Office of State Secretary, uh, appointed subsequently to uh, Deputy M Head of Mission um, to the Embassy of Slovak Republic in Washington, uh, and finally uh, finished that, that posting by going back to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, in the Slovak Republic. He spent a brief period, a year or so, uh, in sort of municipal government as the, uh, office, in the office of the mayor of Bratislava as head of foreign relations and protocol, returned to the foreign ministry, uh, and in 2014 was named ambassador uh, of the Slovak Republic to Canada. So we're very pleased to have you join us tonight. Uh, so please welcome the ambassador of Slovak Republic, um, His Excellency Andrei Dilba. Well, good afternoon, and thank you very much for the kind introduction and for the warm welcome. Excellencies, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's a true honor for me to be here today. Um, I remember I attended one of the um, Ambassador Speaky Series lecture as almost one of my first events when I, when I came to Ottawa in the fall of 2014, and I enjoyed it um, very much. I tried not to miss any, although I did, as I was pointed out. Uh, but it was always beyond my control. So, um, Mr. Letterman, thank you so much for having me. It's a true honor for me to uh, stand here today as the speaker. Um, and what I'd like to speak about is the, um, is the presidency of Slovakia in the uh, Council of the European Union, which Slovakia held in the second half of 2016. Um, before going um, and speaking about our priorities, let me start with saying a little bit what the presidency meant for us. After 12 years of membership in the EU, Slovakia was honored to lead the European Union. The presidency was a milestone for us, 
on a long and sometimes a bumpy journey. The journey began after the Velvet Revolution in 1989 and the Velvet Divorce with the Czech Republic in 1993 by a dream of our leaders to be again part of the free and democratic world. A journey that led to our integration into the European family of nations in 2004. A family we are bound with by rich history and common values. Indeed, back to Europe was one of the principal slogans of the Velvet Revolution. Um, and it was a voice of our European identity. We are proud to call the European Union our home, Euro our currency, and Schengen our area. The EU provides us with security, stability, and prosperity. We are very grateful for that because we were given a lot, and by assuming the role of a presidency, it was time for us to now give back. But we did not have it easy. We joined the European Union in 2004, when the euro optimism was at its peak. But we assumed the presidency in 2016 when passion for EU membership has been replaced by enlargement fatigue and euro skepticism. When radicalism and extremism with easy solutions to complex problems put pressure on the mainstream political parties. After the economic and financial crisis put to the test our trust in the euro and our economic foundations. After migration touched upon our humanism and capacity to help the rest of the world. And after one country decided to leave European Union. That all has brought an urgent need to jointly reflect on the future direction of the Union in 27 format. I'm sure that we, what we all want is a modern and forward-looking Europe. A Europe of and for its citizens. There is much more than unites us. There is much, much more that unites us than divides us. We must be very clear in talking with our citizens. With this aim, we wanted our presidency to be pragmatic because it was time to deliver tangible and concrete results, uniting since we, need, we needed to overcome fragmentation and individual approach in Europe, and we wanted to be a presidency of uh, people's voice, as we have to deal with real problems of people such as jobs, unemployment, security, migration, and terrorism. To achieve this, we had four ambitions or priorities. One was to make European economy stronger. Second, to modernize and broaden the single market in areas such as energy and the digital economy. The third, to work towards sustainable migration and asylum policy. And fourth, to pay attention to our external environment, namely trade deals and enlargement policy. Um, and I would call this globally engaged Europe. Just a few days before we assumed the presidency, the citizens of UK uh, took an unprecedented decision to leave the European Union. It was the first time ever that a member state decided to uh, to leave uh, the Union. Though we prepared our presidency program with such a possibility in mind, we all know that this decision put extra challenge and had a major impact on the whole atmosphere, not only in the EU. This made the context of our presidency very challenging. Not only because of the continued migration crisis, economic challenges, and acts of terrorism, but more importantly because of the urgent need to reflect on the future of the EU and on how to bring the EU closer to its citizens. Now I'll mention two areas where I feel um, are the most significant achievements of the Slovak uh, presidency in the EU. Um, and one is the Bratislava summit, uh, with the Bratislava declaration and Bratislava roadmap. And the second was the signing of CETA and SPA, the Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement between the EU and Canada and Strategic Partnership Agreement. Uh, Bratislava summit um, happened or took place on the 16th of September. Um, and it was an adequate and much needed response to the whole atmosphere in the EU and to the conditions that I described. The summit, though not planned, can certainly be considered an important event, an important achievement of our presidency. It launched the long overdue and absolutely essential discussion on how to make the European Union better and more efficient for all of us. The leaders confirmed their ambition to continue with the project of European integration by adoption of Bratislava Declaration. It focuses on security, prosperity, and improved communication among the member states, institutions, and European citizens. The Bratislava Roadmap, uh, that was also adopted at the Bratislava Summit, defines specific EU priorities for the next six months. 
They include protection of the Union's external borders, internal and external security, including the fight against terrorism, and measures to combat youth unemployment. And it has already brought the first effects, ratification of the Paris Agreement and the launch of the European border and Coast Guard. The second uh, significant achievement is, as I said, the signing of uh, strategic partnership agreement and the comprehensive economic and trade agreement between the European Union and Canada. Um, although SPA kind of you know, um, goes in the shadow of CETA because CETA is getting much more attention and much more visibility, but the strategic partnership agreement is, uh, is an important agreement that elevates the relations between the European Union and Canada to new strategic level. Uh, we are uh, very close partners, we're strategic partners, um, and the SPA deals with areas and cooperation in the fields of peace and security, uh, migration, fight against terrorism, um, innovation and research, people-to-people uh, -people contact, climate and, and environment policy. The CETA, um, everybody probably um, heard about what the agreement brings. Um, it's the most uh, modern and progressive trade agreement that has ever been signed by Canada or by the European Union. Uh, we all recall a little bit of drama that was accompanied uh, by the signing of CETA, but then I occasionally tease my Belgian friends that now everybody in Canada knows where Belgium is. Um, and, um, but what's important is that we managed to sign the agreement on the 30th of October. Um, what we feel that also helped to overcome some of the concerns of some of the member states that they, that they had was the meeting of uh, economy and trade ministers in Bratislava in the late September 2016, where then uh, Minister of International Trade Freeland had the opportunity to meet her EU colleagues, and she made a very eloquent agree argument for the, for the agreement and what benefits it will bring after it comes into provisional application, which, will, which we hope will happen um, sometimes um, late spring, early summer, uh, May, June this year. It will effectively remove about 99% of trade quotas um, and tariffs on the import of products uh, from Canada to Europe, European Union, or from European Union uh, countries to Canada, thus increasing the trade volume, creating jobs, providing opportunities for business. Uh, and for the country as Slovakia, we not only love free trade, but we depend on free trade. About 80% of our GDP is created through free trade and trade as such. Um, so for us, we see this as a great uh, opportunity that we supported from the very beginning. Now the ratification process has started in the European Union countries with Latvia being the first country to uh, ratify the treaty just last week. Um, the process here in Canada uh, goes, my understanding is very smoothly and again uh, European Union and Canada should be ready uh, for the provisional application uh, that spring. We also recently welcomed Prime Minister Trudeau uh, to Europe when the day after uh, the, the treaty was, uh, was approved by the European Parliament, he spoke on the 16th of February in the European Parliament, highlighting the benefits um, and the basic meaning of the treaty. So um, these are two highlights or the most significant achievements uh, that uh, we take pride in achieving or helping to achieve as the Slovak presidency. And now before going to the specific results for the four priorities that I described, I would like to share with you a few numbers that will give you a better idea what it means to have the presidency of the Council of the EU uh, during the period of July to December 2016. We have chaired 49 formal meetings of the Council, either in Brussels or in Luxembourg. The number of experts meetings covered by our colleagues um, in Brussels is even more impressive. It amounted to more than 1,200. Bratislava hosted 18 ministerial meetings and close to 25,000 delegates uh, came uh, from 45 countries to visit Bratislava or visit Slovakia. Besides that, Slovak embassies have organized more than 250 cultural events related directly with the presidency. And now let me briefly run through the four uh, priority areas. The first being economically strong Europe. We are pleased that under our presidency we have managed to adopt a flexible and balanced EU budget for 2017. It reflects our current priorities, which are unemployment, migration and security, and increases by 12% financial resources allocated for supporting economic growth and addressing youth unemployment. The Council, under our leadership, approved its position on a proposal to extend duration, 
and financial capacity of the European Fund for Strategic Investment. The Slovak presidency also managed to reach a wide support of member states to a compromise package on a midterm review of multi-annual financial framework 2016-2020 that allocates additional amount of 6 billion euros to job creation, growth, migration and security challenges. We managed to unblock the negotiations and reach an agreement on the directive of the, on the protection of the financial interests of the EU. The objective of this directive is to deter fraudsters improve the prosecution and sanctioning of crimes against the EU budget. It also aims to facilitate the recovery of misused EU funds in order to, in order to increase the protection of EU taxpayers' money. Modern single market, here we focused on, um, especially on overcoming the fragmentation of the internal market, um, specifically when it comes to single digital market and energy union. The completion of digital single market bears a great potential of pre creating new jobs for the EU citizens, and it brings real benefits for EU citizens. Uh, up until today, there are certain areas in the EU where you cannot order online products from some parts of the European Union, or you know we had roaming charges where you pay different fee when you speak on your cell phone in different countries of Europe. Um, and we felt that in this area we can bring real benefits to people. Um, and something that will bring the European Union much closer to them. So the completion of the digital single market, um, as I said, brings a great potential for job creation. Thanks to our presidency's efforts, geo-blocking and international roaming charges or cross-border portability of online content services will hopefully soon be the thing of the past. The Slovak presidency has also promoted the idea of free Wi-Fi in public spaces such as parks um, and, and, and public buildings. At the same time, the Slovak presidency has worked hard on bringing the energy union closer to reality. And I'm glad we reached here an important political success, the agreement with the European Parliament on the proposal on establishing an information exchange mechanism with regard to intergovernmental inter agreements in the field of energy, which is the first and fundamental building block of the energy union. There is no doubt that the climate policy is an inseparable part of the energy union. Thus, the ratification of the Paris Agreement is an important result of the Presidency's efforts. And it sends an important message to all of our partners that the European Union is able to cooperate and react jointly to global challenges. Sustainable migration and asylum policy. Of course, it is no secret uh, that this was very closely followed by all our partners, uh, that you know, at the time when Europe uh, continued to face a um, great influx of uh, of refugees and, and migrants. And that's why we focused on the root causes of migration and on the issues where consensus uh, can present a way forward. We are pleased that the European Border and Coast Guard Agency has officially started its work at the beginning of October, making the agency operational, which was one of our four key priorities, contributes to protection of the Union external borders. I'm convinced that we will all agree that every member state must contribute to solving the migration crisis. Certain situations require us to bear collective responsibility. On the other hand, we should respect the real possibilities, capacities, and capabilities of individual member states. This is the reasoning behind our proposal of effective solidarity. With this concept, we unblock the stuck discussion on managed uh, and manage to bring closer some um, antagonized and opposed position of the member states. I hope that the Council will elaborate further on this proposal during the current Maltese presidency. The fourth area, globally engaged Europe. The Council under our leadership adopted its negotiation position on the European Fund for Sustainable Development. The aim of the fund is to address the root causes of illegal migration, in particular by creating the opportunities, encouraging investment, and facilitating sustainable development in partner countries. The fund, once established, will have the potential to mobilize up to 44 billion euros of investment to Africa and European neighborhood. At the same time, the ambition of the Slovak presidency was to enhance the credibility of enlargement process. Uh, we are very strong advocates of the open door policy of the enlargement process. Um, as a country that benefited greatly from the enlargement of the EU, uh, we very strongly um, support and will always support uh, the countries that are aspiring for the EU membership, mainly from the Western Balkans. Effective enlargement policy is an important tool for political and economic transformation in Europe. 
and we are thus pleased that four new negotiation chapters were open in the accession process with Serbia and two chapters in the accession process with Montenegro. The Council, under our leadership, also adopted conclusions asking the Commission to assess Bosnia and Herzegovina's application for the EU membership. Strong trade links, as I said, uh, with clear global economies are an integral part of active engagement of Europe on the global scene. Signing the comprehensive uh, economic and trade agreement with Canada is certainly an important moment uh, for the transatlantic trade. We are convinced that this agreement will open a new pool of business opportunities uh, for both the EU as well as Canada. The Council, under our leadership, agreed on its negotiation position on visa liberalization with Georgia and Ukraine, which will then allow for an easier travel um, of, the, of the citizens of the EU to those two countries and of the citizens of those two countries to, uh, to Europe. When it comes to European global engagement, we'll face new reality after Brexit. And, um, and in the globally changing uh, the world context, um, we expect few elections in Europe this year uh, in a very important countries, Netherlands, uh, France, and Germany. No one can now predict the development and the future. We must resist the temptation of inward-looking discussion now in the changing global context more than ever. And few general remarks to conclude. Our ambition for the presidency, our ambitions for the presidency, uh, we feel were realistic. We wanted to enforce the unity of the Union. Thus, we have focused on the issues that bring us together rather than divide us. This is the only way how to counterbalance the ever stronger voices of Euro skeptics. At the end of the presidency, we can state that our priorities were the right ones. And we can be satisfied with what we have managed to accomplish. After the EU presidency, we have moved from the presidency's chair into the chair of an ordinary member. Mm. But we are more experienced. To reach an agreement of the EU 28 often seemed impossible. <clears throat> Thus, the presidency must be equipped with courage, patience, tolerance, and meekness. Our achievements prove that it is possible and that a small country such as Slovakia can manage very well. With our new experience, we will continue being an active and efficient member of the European Union. Thank you very much for the attention. Uh, some of it was a little more technical, but some of it you know, came from me as a, as a diplomat representing my country. I also want to, uh, want to put on record an excellent communication and cooperation that we had with the EU delegation in Ottawa. Uh, in Ambassador Collins, we, had a, we have a wonderful advocate of the, of the EU values. Um, she has always been very supportive of us. Um, and I think she, um, she, she, she really accomplished a lot in bringing Canada and the EU, EU closer together. So thanks very much. And one of the benefits that I haven't uh, spoken about, but uh, also it's not linked with the, with the CETA, uh, but also during our presidency, we managed to, uh, to overcome one of the discrepancies in the relations between Canada and the European Union, and that is the achievement of uh, visa-free travel. Uh, for the members and the citizens of all 28 EU member states to Canada. Um, of course, Canadians enjoy visa-free travel to Canada, and we're very glad that now, uh, starting December 1st this year, also the citizens of Bulgaria and Romania will be able to, 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 to enjoy the benefits that we all have. Um, so, thanks you very much for the attention. It's a great honor for me to be here, and with that, I'm very honored. And welcome to the press. Uh, Cal Smith, retired military, a comment and a question. The comment first, how does a country the size of Slovakia produce so many good hockey players? Uh, <laughs> my real question, though, is are you, how dependent are you on energy flowing from places further east these days? On energy? Well, most of Europe relies very heavily on gas and oil from, from a not-so-friendly and I wondered, is there any relief from that dependency? Okay. Do we go question by question or we collect Just more? Just use one question. Okay. Um, with hockey, 
Um, no, 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 I'm, I'll start. That, that, that's easy. Um, that, that, that's great. It's remarkable. We, we, you know, it's one of the links that we have between Canada and Slovakia. And um, I sometimes joke when I'm asked why we split, um, you know, Czechoslovakia, Czech Republic, and Slovakia. And of course, I give a historical excursion and I, I explain all the reasons. But I always end up with joke that we we split because we wanted more sets of medals from the hockey games. And now, you know, as one country, you can only get one. But it's not with you. So anyway, thank you very much for that. Um, with the energy, um, that's no secret that uh, most of the countries in Central Europe are um, um, you know, dependent on or take most of their natural resources, being it oil or gas, from Russia. Uh, but we feel that the energy diversification is important. Energy independence is important for us. It's important for the security. It's important as also an economic tool. Um, and that's why um, there is a great deal. Well, that's why the, the thinking of energy union. And that, that's why also a lot of interconnectors uh, connecting Central Europe uh, to other supply routes and other sources. So there are, just recently, uh, we built an interconnector between Hungary and Slovakia, allowing for south-north or north-south. Uh, we also have now, the, we're building a reverse gas flow. In case something happens, you know, Slovakia can be supplied with the same pipeline from the other sources. So uh, we recognize that. Uh, we, we are an important transit country for the Russian oil and gas uh, coming from Russia to, to other countries. Uh, but we also recognize that it's important to diversify the, the routes and also the supply sources. Next question. So I'm, I'm Andrei Pilda, I'm Dean of the Faculty of Public Affairs. Uh, one reaction and then a question. So the reaction is, uh, just saw a report on Bloomberg a few days ago about basically a number of Eastern European countries uh, purchasing, increasing purchases of energy from Iran to diversify the, their supply from other countries that have been talking about. So it'd be interesting to see if that is being felt. My question is, you've spoken very positively about CETA. Where do you see the big areas of gain or potential gain in trade between Slovakia and Canada being over the next five to 20 years? Okay, um, start with the trade. Um, well, the trade volume between Slovakia and Canada is not that big. I think the annual trade volume is about 250 million euros with a positive balance on the Slovak side. Uh, the, the biggest commodity that we import to Canada, that we export to Canada, are vehicles. You know, that Slovakia is, uh, when it comes to per capita, we are the number one car producer in the world, producing over one million vehicles. Uh, so any Porsche Cayenne, any Volkswagen Touareg that you see being driven on the, on the roads here in Canada was made in Slovakia. Um, and we sell a lot of um, our vehicles also to Germany. And we have a great trade with Germany. So we feel that the benefits of CETA will not only be in the, in, you know, in the, the, the primary trade with Canada, but also with this increased volume in trade with countries such as Germany and other, other big European countries. Um, and again, you know, we, we trade a lot. I mean, our economy, as I said, depends on the, on the, on the trade. Um, so that's, um, we welcome the agreement. Um, there are only very, very few opposing voices in, in Slovakia, and I don't foresee any, any real difficulties with the ratification of the CETA in Slovakia. And on energy, um, of course, you know, I, I am not aware of any um, specific deals made with Iran, but um, I know that the countries are looking for different, you know, different sources. My name is George Frakor. I was a former professor here at Carleton University and also did a little bit of professing in Slovakia at some time. What I would like to ask is uh, when uh, Slovakia has said in the migration problem that it will only accept Christians as migrants into Slovakia, and obviously migration is going to be a really big problem in all of Europe. It is a really big problem in all of Europe. Is there any way that Slovakia or the European unions can somehow get together and decide on a way to either cut off migration by sending a hell of a lot of money and keeping people at home, or changing the migration pattern so they can accept others? That's uh, the main question. I have another one later, but let's see what you do with this one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you know, that, um, 
when we faced the migration crisis at the beginning, there was a proposal of quotas um, that each country would, based on the population and performance of the economy, accept certain number of refugees and migrants. Because uh, there are different categories. Of course, there are refugees who are fleeing for their life, uh, to save their lives. But there are also economic migrants who come for the, the better economic opportunities in our countries. Uh, and what we said uh, from the beginning was that the quota proposal will not work. Because these uh, refugees and migrants, they had few destination countries in their mind. They were not stopping in Hungary. They were not stopping in Slovakia. They were not even stopping in Austria. They were continuing to Germany and to, to, to Sweden, where they um, felt. Uh, and, and also, um, again, you, know, you cannot force somebody to stay in your territory. So even if we would accept a certain number of refugees, then there was no way that we could keep them in Slovakia. And there was a case with a few other countries that, that took some of the, the refugees, and then they disappeared from the territory. They continued on their, on their journey to other countries. Um, so we, uh, we, we advocated for a, a more pragmatic solution uh, where each country would contribute with what's in their capacities, capabilities, and what will certainly help. Uh, again, you know, the, the first priority for us was to stop the, well, to protect the external borders of the European Union. We have Schengen. Um, and as a result, some of the countries suspended temporarily some of the application of the free Schengen area. Um, and also to stop the, the smuggling of people, because this is trafficking. We, uh, you know, this is a humanitarian, this is a social, this is economic, uh, this is demographic, and this is also a security challenge. Um, and, you know, who, we, um, as human beings, the primary concern was to stop people from dying when they make the dangerous journey um, across the Aegean Sea or you know, crossing from Libya to Italy. Uh, so those were the primary concerns for us. And of course, um, um, Slovakia being a country that is very solid, uh, we have contributed uh, you know, a, a, a few tens of millions of euros to certain funds uh, to, to address exactly what you said, the root causes of the conflict. Uh, to, 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 to make the countries from these uh, people are fleeing safer so they can, they can see their future. Uh, we, uh, we also helped the Austrians at its peak uh, with housing of some of the refugees when the Austrian capacities were, were filled to the, uh, to the top. Um, and we, you know, we offer scholarships. Uh, for, we just recently offered 500 scholarships to students from Syria. Um, so these are all the ways that we feel can can, can, can bring real difference and can Slovakia contribute to the solution. There was some uh, question about uh, energy. I just want, I would like to remember that uh, my country, Algeria, who is a member associate to the UN, to the European Union, is uh, also a major supplier of oil and gas to Europe, and that we have three uh, pipelines from my country via uh, Spain and Italy. But you know, I have appreciated your thorough presentation, but uh, I would like to ask you a question as an uh, ordinary member state of the European Union. It seems that uh, the European Union is at uh, the crossroads, and that there is a, a strong feeling that uh, the advancement is uh, in sort of in pace, and what is called uh, Euroscepticism is rampant. Uh, and uh, we see that through uh, the uh, decision by Great Britain to leave the uh, European Union, and it seems that uh, some other countries are online for, for that. It seems al al also that the political context with the, uh, the new advent of uh, uh, extremist uh, uh, parties and also the uh, likeliness that some uh, rightist uh, leader will uh, grab power in some countries like uh, uh, France and uh, others in the coming uh, election. So uh, to your view, is there any uh, need to prove uh, a new uh, uh, breath to the European Union? Or given the uh, uh, division existing, and since we have noticed also there is no advancement in the defense and security policy or in the foreign policy. At the same time, we have seen that the European Union uh, policy uh, pertaining to neighborhood is a standstill, especially to the uh, South countries in the uh, North African and uh, Arab countries, 
where there is no more connection uh, and the process of Barcelona is almost uh, dead. So uh, it seems that uh, things are changing and there is no perceptions. And also within European Union, we have the feeling that uh, there is a, a game between major countries, medium-sized countries and small countries. And there is a sort of uh, deception uh, from some uh, component of the European society. Uh, as, a, as a colleague, uh, what you see all those problems, because we are very linked to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to European Union. We trade 80% of our trade with, with this, this, uh, this, this regional uh, organization. Thank you for okay. taking uh, my answer and maybe giving us some answers. Well, um, I'll try. Well, I'm a strong believer in Europe. And occasionally, we need to be reminded by the, by the strength and the positive elements that exist in European Union by some other players. Because when you, uh, when you read the papers, um, you read about challenges, about crises, about problems. But the European Union um, is still strong, powerful, and, 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 and great. It has brought the longest period of peace in Europe. Um, it has brought uh, the economic prosperity. It has brought uh, you know, all the benefits for the citizens. Um, do we need a better communication with our citizens? Yes. Are there challenging challenges? Yes. But I liked um, High Representative for Foreign Policy, Frederica Mogherini, when she was recently in Bratislava addressing the conference of the EU ambassadors. Um, you know, she reminded us that you know, we, we, we haven't lost the attraction to some of the um, you know, um, countries that are aspiring for the membership. Uh, we, we can act as a united bloc when it comes to you know, Paris Agreement, when it comes to, uh, to CETA. Uh, so you know, I'm, I'm a believer in the European future, but the benefits of the um, European Union must be uh, communicated in a much clearer um, way to the citizens and counterbalance some of the, some of the voices. Um, you know, it's, um, it's um, and you're right, um, the Euroscepticism in Europe, it's on the rise. Um, the anti-establishment wave, it's, um, it's on the rise, and I think it's up uh, to our leaders to, um, to lead. Uh, we will, in two weeks' time, we will celebrate, well, in about a month, we will celebrate the 60th anniversary of the signing of the Rome Treaties, uh, which is an important milestone. Um, commission will come, I think, this week or next week uh, with four uh, scenarios of the future developments in Europe. Um, and this is all a reflection on the discussions that we had in Bratislava. Um, and each country contributes with its voice. Uh, that voice sometimes may vary, but I think we all are united in seeing the bigger picture and seeing that Europe and European Union has no alternative whatsoever. It's not a problem, it's a solution. It's the answer to the problems, it's not the problem. Um, and I just you know, would, uh, would like to see that we are uh, very clear in telling that to our citizens and making them realize that yes, you know, um, there are no quick solutions. Uh, I, I spoke about that, about the political parties, you know, and I, I think it's a phenomenon all across the world. Um, even in Slovakia, we had a political party that ran on the platform, I'm not a politician, I can be trusted. So then there is something that the politician must do to counterbalance that. One more. Just to get uh, some of the problems underway with the uh, European Union as a collection of nations. Czechoslovakia was once a nation, became two. Part of Slovakia was Ruthenia, which is now part of Ukraine. In Spain, there is a group which wishes to secede from Spain and be a separate nation. Is the European Union doing anything to sort of, sort of get a problem like that, Italy, Spain, other places, solved? Or will the European Union actually break up? At one time, there were two parts of Germany. The North and the South were different in religion. That still is probably a sentiment in a number of uh, what are called nations. Ukraine, in particular at the moment, is such and such. Does the European Union have an outlook on that, or is it necessary to have an outlook on that? 
I think we should be ready for, for everything, but I, I, I would reply in a very short answer, George. I will not go into speculations. I'll just reply, European Union is united in diversity, and I hope it will remain so. My name is Katerina, and I'm a student at Nipsia. I'm from Bulgaria, oh. born in Bratislava. <laughs> um, I watch the news, and I watch sometimes Bulgarian news, and it's so good, the ideas about we should stay united and all that, but in fact, at least from what I see in Bulgaria, people are afraid. It's uh, the refugees that are coming, it's a big security concern, and what do you think how the European Union collectively should address people's fears? Because they give prices to extremist voices, to riots. We had some crimes as well. So it's, it's an issue. What should be the response? Thanks. Well, I, I think we are seeing some of the responses. Um, and it's the creation of the European Border and Coast Guard that, that came to effect at the beginning of uh, October last year. Uh, you know, we, I think European leaders understand the concerns. Uh, and again, you know, as I said, this is a very complex issue. It has the elements of the humanitarian crisis, it bears the security challenges, it's economy, it's demography, um, it's, 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 it's all of it. Uh, but I think the views of the European citizens are taken into consideration. And we see that implemented in the better protection of the external borders in helping to address the root causes of the, of the migration, um, you know, the treaty with Turkey. Uh, so, I mean, those voices are heard, and I think our leaders are doing their best to address them. It will take time, it's not, I mean, it's not easy. Uh, as I was listening to uh, Ambassador Drova speaking, it reminded me how the world has changed. Uh, if we had heard this, if I'd heard this speech, 15, 20 years ago, I would have had a lot fewer gray hair, but a passionate defense of free trade and of the European project would have been kind of commonplace. It was the world we lived in then. Everybody believed in Europe. Everybody believed in free trade. 15, 20 years later, all of a sudden, we're in a world that has changed dramatically. Key architects of the world trading system are now questioning the basis on which they built this free trading system. People who have benefited immensely from the European project are questioning the value of the project itself. It'd be very difficult times for all of us to think. If you're old like me and you kind of go back and you say, well, this was kind of the way the world should be. A belief in freedom, a belief in in both freedom of in individuals and of trade patterns, if you want to be uh, uh, commercial about it. So it was very heartening, Ambassador Droba, for this old guy like I am to listen to these encouraging words, to listen to this alternative view, this view of hope, this view of belief in the future, of belief in our democratic institutions, belief in our shared common purpose as the trading nations of the world. So thank you very much for bringing this ray of optimism uh, to us here today. It's a pleasure to have uh, listened to you, so thank you. <laughs>